Take your Bible, turn to 1 Peter, if you would. Appreciate that. I um, talked to Sister Pam last night and Sister Linda Toomey. Sister Pam seems to be doing a little bit better. She was here Sunday night, told her we were glad of that, and I reassured her that if she needed anything in this world, that that's what her church was for. Uh, we promised, I promised, I promised, we promised on behalf of this church that if she needed anything in the, um, told, told this to Keith that we'd take good care of her. And then I talked to Sister Linda Toomey and my call was uh, very, it was at the right time because she informed me that she broke her other foot yesterday. Um... She had set her walker in the hallway to go into her restroom. And when she stepped down on her other unbroken foot, it, she heard it pop. And she immediately fell. And so she said, I'm not doing well. And I can imagine that. So um, just pray for her and lift her up. Uh, she watches online, so hello, Sister Linda, we love you, and Sister Pam as well, and to everybody else that is still sick this time of year, and sometimes when winter comes and people get sick, they tend to stay that way for a long time, so I can understand why some people don't like winter time. amen. So let's pray for those that are sick and pray for those that are hurting and pray for those that have needs. And you just never know what people go through on a weekly basis when we don't see them. And uh, so just always pray for one another. If you have that prayer list, that sheet, it's always good to just go through there. And that way you have a visual reminder of what people need and what people are suffering with and so on. And so just continue to lift people up and pray for them. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, and then um, Kelly uh, is a friend of theirs, and she is dying with COPD. Now, I don't know, I'm going to say something. I don't know Kelly, and I don't know her circumstances. But in some cases, COP is brought out by too many cigarettes. And if you smoke, now's the time to quit. Amen? Um, I, Lisa brought this to my attention yesterday. We were pulling out of the gas station. And she just happened to notice that I think it was a pack of Marlboros. Would you quit smoking when they turned a quarter a pack? He told Gloria, when cigarettes hit a quarter a pack, I'm quitting. So he comes home one day and throws a big fit because he ain't got no fresh cigarettes. And she said, well, you said when they go to a quarter a pack and they had we hit a quarter a pack. And that's why she didn't buy no more. So he quit. But five dollars and ten cents a pack for Marlboros. Now, if you. Eight dollars. In California, it doesn't surprise me, they're not $8 a cigarette. But $5.10 a pack for Marlboro. And if you do two packs a day, that's 10 bucks a day times seven. That's 70 bucks a week times four. $280 a month, that's a car payment. Okay? And uh, I, don't, I don't talk a lot about smoking. I just... Uh, there's other things to talk about, but uh, my brother-in-law died from COPD. He smoked two to three packs a day every day, and other people that you, you just don't do very well on those things. So if you smoke now, is it, now I'm not. I don't know how Kelly came down with COPD, but that's where it leads. And so now's a good time to quit. Can I hear God's people say Amen? It's just not. God's best for you. Amen. All right. That's a different type of fiery trial. How's that for a segue? All right. 
First Peter chapter four. Um, let's look at, we'll pick it up in verse 12. Uh, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Underline that. Keep that in your mind. Uh, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. Father, we come before you tonight and I ask for your grace, the manifestation, Lord, of your mercy and your help tonight uh, upon those, Lord, that are struggling, those that are hurting, those that are sick. Lord, it just seems like there's some things that are hitting people that are not letting go. And Father, we believe that everything that happens is for, for your cause, your glory, your kingdom, your honor's sake. And we thank you, Lord, that our lives, our lives, Father, are the reason that you do what you do. It is to bring glory and honor in everything that happens to us, whether good or bad. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for fiery trials. I thank you, God, for causing us to go through periods of life where it's just not all sunshine and roses. But Father, I thank you for the fire that you cause your people and you allow your people to go through. And Father, we pray, dear God, that if, if anybody uh, here tonight or hearing the sound of my voice tonight if anybody, Lord, is going through such a fiery trial, Father, we think of Sister Linda Toomey. I pray, God, that you would bring healing to her. And, Lord, just help her. She has, to my knowledge, God, she has never, ever been angry at you, but always rejoicing, even in the trying times, even, Father, when things were bad. And Lord, that's what I hear from her now is she's glad that she knows you. She's glad that she has faith. And Father, we appreciate her testimony. Lord, it's been consistent all these years that she loves you and she is glad that you've been so good to her. Father, we think of Sister Pam tonight and Sister Linda Carmichael and, and, and Sister Lynn and all of the other ladies, Lord, who are widows in our church. We pray, God, that you would just visit with them and bless them and give them your grace and comfort. Father, if anybody's sick, Lord, that you bring healing to them. If anybody, Lord, is, uh, Lord, if they have gotten cold on you and they are distant from you, Father, there's no doubt that because of that or for that reason, Lord, there's sin in their life. I pray, God, that you would deliver them from it. God, that you would have mercy on them and you would forgive them. Lord, this is what we pray for our brothers and sisters. This is what we pray, Lord, for our neighbors, Lord, because we could be just like them. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would have mercy upon your people tonight. Give them grace. Father, we thank you for those that you allowed to be here tonight. Pray, Lord, that you would lift them up, that you would guide us in your word. Help us, dear God, give us understanding of the things, Father, that we have gone through and, Father, the things that we are yet to go through. So, Lord, open up our eyes and show us great and mighty things tonight. We ask for your blessings on your word. We love you and we trust you. Bless our fellowship tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, just in, I'm just going to reiterate some things left over from last Wednesday night. Just kind of segue into what I'm talking about tonight and just to kind of give you a little idea of what I believe and what I stand for. Uh, there in first Peter chapter four, he says, beloved, think it not a strange, his beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. I'll never forget the day that I read this, uh, and I'm studying the Bible, looking for, looking for answers, looking for help, looking for understanding. God is sort of giving me a ministry to study prophecy. So I want to know some things 
that are going on. And I told God that I would just throw everything out and let him put it back the way that he wanted. I'm not saying that I'm right on everything. I'm not saying I have all the answers. But there are some things that I questioned that I had thought earlier in life or things that I had taught as, been taught as a young man. And the idea that we're going to continue on as we are and then we're going to be instantly translated into heaven uh, before any bad thing happens or anything of a biblical significance happens. That's what I was taught. That's what I believed. That's what I thought that I knew or how I understood it. But there were some things that were in the scriptures that I was reading that did not, did match that. And I remember reading this the, for the first time, really. And it just seemed like the Holy Ghost was knocking at my door saying, Mike, take a look at that. Because I think a fiery trial is coming. That's what I'm thinking. I think a fiery trial is coming. I think, uh, take your Bible, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. I think that the day of Christ, I'm doing uh, a study during Pastor Mike Online. Uh, although Brother George gave me something tonight that I, may, I could spend hours talking about tomorrow. So I'm going to try not to. But I'm doing a study on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord and what that means. There's variants of that. The day of the Lord, the day of the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of God. And here he's mentioning the day of Christ. Uh, I think it's in Philippians. I can't remember. My, I don't have my notes in front of me. But twice Paul referenced the day of Christ. And he said that it was when his glory is going to be revealed. And so he mentions here in 2 Thessalonians 2. that he, And he says in verse 1. By our gathering together unto him. From what I can see in scripture, our gathering together unto Christ is the day of the translation, the day of the rapture, the day of his glorious appearing. Jesus is going to appear in the air. The, de the trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. We which are alive and men shall be caught up together with them. That is our gathering together unto Christ. And so he says, verse two, that you be not soon shaken in mind. That also is relevant. Or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. And let me just throw this in as a side note. Always, always, always live your life so that it is obvious that you believe that the day of Christ is at hand. That phrase at hand, it, I mean, it's very simple to, to understand that. It means within reach. It is, it's right here. And it's within, it's within our grasp. It's, it's, it, it's an imminent, immediate, it could happen. Always live your life so that everybody about you knows that you believe that the day of Christ is at hand. Can I hear you say amen? In other words, if there's things in your life that you're worried about, things in your life that are not right with God, Get on your face before God and don't stop wrestling with God until he gives you peace, until those things are settled so that you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if he were to appear in the air, you're gone. You're going with him and not be stuck down here because I'm going to tell you something. When God closes the door of the ark, he did not open it back up until the waters had abated and he had scoured this earth of everything that was unclean. In other words, when God closes the door, he's closing that door. And some people cannot, and I was preaching a little bit about this Sunday, some people cannot comprehend the idea of finality or that rules do apply to them. And at some point, they're going to have to face the facts and deal with their sins, their crimes, their disobedience. Some people think that everybody should just make uh, arrangements for them or that there's nothing definite. That there's, there's some people, we were watching this in my office before church. There are some people who are constantly in a courtroom making plea deals and making arrangements with the prosecutor and with the judge to continue. There was one lady that got caught shoplifting. She was there on a shoplifting charge. She was on probation having been found guilty for a prior shoplifting charge. She was on probation means don't get don't do this again and we'll let you go. 
She got caught while she's on probation for another shoplifting charge. To me, that means you go back to jail. You know what she asked? Can I get my probation extended? You know what the judge said? Sure. They gave her another two months of probation. That's a reward for shoplifting. That's not punishment. But there's some people who constantly live their lives as if the world is going gonna, is gonna to go their way ad infinitum and they should never have to deal with the consequences of their actions or their sins. God will long suffer only so long and then he shuts a door. And you've always got people thinking that after God shuts a door, well, maybe he'll open it up for me. Maybe if I go to hell, maybe I can ask God to let me out of hell. I don't know of a situation in the whole Bible where God let somebody out of hell. I don't, I don't, believe, I don't believe it. And so anyway, um, when the day of Christ happens... That's it. After that, I believe his wrath starts being poured out on this world. And some people can't, they don't want to think about that. They don't want to deal with that. There are churches that don't want to talk about that. It's not about judgment. It's not about God's wrath. It's about how good God is and how much money we can make. So he says, the day of Christ is at hand. And he says, verse three, let a man deceive you by any means for that day. What day? The day of Christ are gathering together unto him. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And when I read that, that instantly changed my outlook on the timing of our being gathered together unto Christ. To me, it changed it, it altered because I thought, I was taught that nothing happens before the, tr the translation or the rapture. But here it obviously does. It says a falling away takes place first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So I take these two things and I put them together. The falling away, the shaking, and a fiery trial, which is to try you. Because he says, do not think this is a strange thing. Don't think this is out of the ordinary, my friends. It's not like God is doing something different that he's never done before. Every generation of saint, I believe, in some way endures and goes through a fiery trial. Christian history. The last 2,000 years of this church age is full of people who have suffered, who have been persecuted, who have lost everything including their own lives for the sake and the cause and the glory of Jesus Christ and I've said it before and I'll say it again a faith not worth dying for is not faith worth living for amen if I believe this and I'm willing to live it I'm willing to put everything that I have and everything that I am I've got it invested in this Bible and I've got it invested in my faith if you ask me, am I willing to die for it? Do I want to? No. Am I willing to? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I don't think that we ought to think that a fiery trial happening to us in whatever context it is, whether it's in the context of before we're translated, before we're raptured, before we go home, or just in this life, we are going to have trials. We are going to have tribulations we're going to have times when things are not well and it's not our fault because peter in this whole book talks about two different types of like fiery trials we go through the one we go through it because we had it coming we did something stupid we did something wrong god is chastening us over it we're, we're feeling a little bit of of god's temper over that and yes we're going to have to go through that that's called being a son of the most high god if god loves you he's going to chasten you when you do something wrong when you do something bad amen that's what god's going to do but then on the other hand we are also going to go through trials and tribulations even when we didn't do something wrong 
And if, if you're like Job, did nothing wrong, and yet he's got friends telling him, go ahead, Job, go ahead and curse God and get, it, get this thing over with. You're miserable. We're tired of seeing you like this. Job, did, why don't you just go ahead and tell everybody what you did wrong? And Job said, I didn't do anything wrong. Job knew his conscience. God knew him. God knew that he was going to make it. God sustained him. God helped him through that. But Job is an example to us of what it's like to lose every... In fact, turn to the book of Job. In the context of a fiery trial, turn to the book of Job. Did Job go through a fiery trial? Let's look at it. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, let's look at verse, I'll pick it up in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast, thou, uh, hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And let me say you, you will always have the devil accusing you before almighty God. The Bible says he is the accuser of the brethren. Now, to give the devil something to accuse you over, that's your stupidity. Amen? But when the devil accuses you before God, when you've done nothing wrong, when your conscience is clear, God is clear, and you are living this, you are living a holy and a clean life for the devil to accuse you, God's going to prove him wrong every single time. So he is the accuser of the brethren, and he's accusing God concerning Job. And so he says in verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now here it is. There was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Job, by the way, Job loved his family. Job loved his family. You see, I didn't read the verses before this, but you see Job offering sacrifices for his children. Why? He said, in case my kids have sinned before God, I don't want God to hold it against my children. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, don't forget to pray for your children. It's one thing if we minister to people all over the world and minister to people of Kenya. But if we, in doing that, we fail to minister to those in our own house, we failed. Amen? I'm not saying that if you live right, then naturally your kids are just going to be perfect and upright. I got over that a long time ago. Okay? But I'm saying, Job sacrificed for others that he loved. And that was his family. So watch this. So in verse 14, there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 16, look at this. While he was yet speaking, watch this. Look at your Bible. There came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. Look at there. And hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Job goes through in this whole book a fiery trial. The fire of God fell. That's what it said. And then verse 17, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, in the slain uh, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, 
Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, what do I see here? I see one, two, three, four things happen. Four things, four bad reports that Job gets. What does Paul say we're wrestling against? Principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. These things are always going to be against us and they're always going to try everything they can to get us to do one thing. Curse God. I'll say this. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. You can be punished for things you've done wrong. The punishment you get is nowhere near the punishment you deserve. But there will also come times when you do well. When you serve God, when you live for God, when you honor God, when you live a righteous and a clean life. And sometimes we, I guess we kind of think that maybe that deserves a little merit from God or a little extra credit from God. Look at God, look at us. This is what we're doing. This is what we're, how we're living. Look at how we clean we are. God I did all these things very, very well. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in other people's lives. I've seen it in my family's life. I've seen it in people in this church life. And I'm telling you that you can serve God and live right and do well and the devil will beat you to death over that. And God will let that happen like God let this happen to Job. The charismatic crowd and the whole word faith movement, they, they want to plant it in your mind that if you live by God's rules and do everything right, then all these great, wonderful, good Things are going, they have to happen to you and no bad thing can happen to you. And that's not always true. It's not always true. So why would God do that? Why would God, when you've been doing right, I mean, God says, God, God chastened you when you turned bad. God whooped you, right? God got you. And he says, don't do that again. So you believed him. So then you lived right and you did right and you did you did well and you did it for a while. Why would God allow you then? Why would God allow the devil to come and just walk all over the top of you? Why would he do that? That's it. Jared, it's all about faith. And. Here's what I know, OK? I consider myself a fundamentalist, not a liberal. I'm a conservative. I believe in the fundamentals. I, I believe in a strict, uh, a strict way of seeing the Bible. And if God says it's this way, then it's this way. That's, that's just how I am. And I know fundamentalists pretty well. And they get awfully cocky. Because we like our hair cut real short. And we don't wear long hair. Some of you like that so well, you cut, got it all gone. And we like our ladies to look feminine and dress modest. And we like our children to, to, to look and, and behave a certain way. And, and we don't, we don't go to these places and we don't do these amusements and we don't, we don't do these things. And what happens is we can get very, very arrogant about living right. And I, I remind us all that it's not just the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes that's a sin. It's the pride of what? Life. We can get proud about our life. About how what, we don't do this and we don't do that. And we get proud. And then we start thinking we're actually better and superior than everybody else. And that no wonder God is blessing us. Well, he had to. I mean, look at how we're living. I've done that. I've been part of that. I've experienced all of that. And God reminded me one day, Mike, you are nowhere near what you think you are. And you're nowhere near what you let everybody else think you are either. The purpose 
of the fiery trial. Look at Job, the purpose of the fiery trial. One, two, three, four things hit him. And at the end of that, he still worships God. And he gives him the praise. I mean, after all, when we realize that this life and everything in it is a vapor. It's like in the wintertime when you breathe and that cold vapor comes out of your mouth. You can see it for about, what, three, four, five seconds maybe. What happens to it after that? It's gone. And that's our life and everything in this life. And when you realize that the good things that you had in this life, every one of them is going away. I mean, I don't like the thought of this. But I've lost people out of my life already and I'm not done. I'm going to lose more of them. I'm not looking forward to it. But I understand that that's what this world is all about. It's about losing. The next world, we get to keep that forever. We're not going to lose anybody. We're not going to lose anything out of it. And if God's teaching us anything, Jared's right, this Bible's right, if God's teaching us anything, it's a trial of our faith because at the end of the day, we can still say, I believe what God said. God's not a man that he should lie. Somebody say amen. Now turn to uh, Exodus 19. So I'm just, just to throw in my two cents worth of eschatology, which that word means... The study of the last days. Ology is, means the study of. Eschatos means the end. The study of the end. And just to give my two cents worth. I really, I really believe. That before we fly out of here. There's some things that have to be burnt off of us. How many of you know some of those things? I don't want to take them with me. I know that for a fact. So I think a fiery trial is coming. And Paul, Peter said it. It's the trial of our faith. Because there are people who say they believe, but they don't. But how do we know who they are? How does anybody know who they are? We say we believe, but we may be the ones lying and everybody else be telling the truth. And I just think that it's going to be manifest at the end when God glorifies his church in front of everybody that the world is finally going to see that. But that day is not now. So Exodus chapter 19 and Exodus 19 is a wonderful, wonderful chapter. Um, and I, I know I'm kind of going back over what I did last Wednesday night. But the point I want to make with this is there is a fire that illuminates and there is a fire that consumes. And in Exodus 19, of course, Exodus 20 is where God spoke audibly to the people of Israel. But in Exodus 19 is when God gathered them. Remember, this is about a gathering. The gathering is going to take place. And so in verse, just very quickly, in verse 18 of Exodus 19, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in what? In fire. So I think the Bible is illustrating to us. The Bible's given us clues. It's not going to give us the whole deal in one place. We have to get it here a little and there a little. But here in Exodus 19, when God comes down, the Lord descends upon Mount Sinai in fire. Now, uh, maybe next one y'all think to put this up on the screen. I've done this before. There are pictures of the real Mount Sinai. It's called Jabal al-Laws. It's in Arabia, like Paul said it was. Sinai is in Arabia. It's not in Egypt. It's in, the, it's in, the, it's in Saudi Arabia, and there's a, there's a mountain there called Jabal al-Laws, and it matches perfectly the description of Mount Sinai in the Bible. And to this day, the top of that mountain is charred black. It's not gone away in all of these years. God literally descended down on top of this mountain in fire. And the top of this mountain was on fire. Amen? 
In fact, how did God appear to, we covered this last Wednesday, how did God appear to Moses when he said, go set my people free? How did God appear to Moses? The, in a bush that was on, that was on fire, but it was not consumed. Turn to, um, turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 2. I think, I think God's telling us something. I think there's clues here. I think the Bible it, it wants us, I think as we get closer to it, we'll understand it better. Maybe, maybe we don't understand it really very well now. Maybe, maybe some are thinking that Hoggard, you're way off. You're, you've gone off your rocker. Why don't you go make a flat earth video and do something important for a while or whatever. But I think that as the closer we get to this saying, I think we're going to see it better. And 2 Kings 2, this is when uh, Elijah went up into heaven by a whirlwind. And when that happened, let's look in verse, uh, let's see here, where, where am I looking for? Verse 14, no, 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 I went past it. Look at verse 11. It came to pass as they still went on and thought that behold, there appeared a chariot of what? Fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah is a foreshadowing of us going into heaven without dying. That's the rapture. It's the translation. And what happens at this time? Fire comes down from heaven. In fact, this horse and this chariot, they were both angels. They were of the angelic realm or the angelic species, I'll call it. And they were real and they were made of fire is what they were made of. That's their substance. That's how they're, that's what God made us out of dirt. Well, he made them out of fire. All right. And both are colored. What color? Oh, come on. This is elementary school. Fire and dirt are what color? Say red. Very good. I don't know why I bother sometimes. Luke, Luke chapter 12. I've come to send fire on the earth, Jesus said. And what will I if it already be kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. That's the fire baptism. And how am I straight until it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on the earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. Think about what happened with Elijah and Elisha. What did the chariot of fire and the horse of fire do with them? Parted them both asunder. He said, I come to send division. For from henceforth, there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. That sounds like when the kids want something from mom and dad. And dad says it's okay, but mom says it ain't okay. It sounds like three against two or two against three. That's how it is at my house anyway. Sometimes I want it. And Mama says no. Amen. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Let's spend a little time in 1 Corinthians 3. Let's look at what Paul said. Now, I'm going to ask you a question tonight. And, and I know it sounds like I'm just teaching all prophecy, but there is a practical application to every bit of this. So I'm going to ask you a question tonight. How is your life spent? How is your life spent? You know, we've only been given so many days on this earth. Is that true? We don't have, if you count your life and the days of your life and match them against eternity you realize that this life really is a vapor and it passes away very quickly and we don't have very much time in this world in this life to do things you know what a bucket list is what's a bucket list before you Kick the bucket. Okay? So Hollywood's made a big deal about this, and everybody's got a bucket. Oh, I want to go to China. Oh, I want to climb Mount Everest. Or I want to do this. Or I want to gamble in Las Vegas. Or I want to sleep with a bunch of women. Or I want to drink a bunch of booze. And, the, 
And that's everybody's life. That's everybody's goal. That's their dream. They got worldly things that they want to accomplish before they die. Because most people have convinced themselves that there is only this life and that's it. But that's not it. There is another life that when we get there, we're going to see just how tiny and insignificant this life really was. And I'm asking the question to each and every person tonight. You, 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 and you, and me. How are we spending our time in this world? What are we serving? What are we doing? We spend, in my opinion, we spend a lot of time on things that absolutely don't matter. They don't matter. Not as far as time and eternity. What is Hebrews? Hebrews 11 is the faith hall of fame. And what did it say about Moses? That Moses chose to follow God rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. Seasons only this long. Compared to a, a year, a season's only this long. And compared to a lifetime, a season is only this long. And Moses chose to go with Israel and lead them and serve God rather than choosing the pleasures of sin that lasted about that long. And if, in fact, I want you to think about every sin you've ever committed. At its very best part, it only lasted a short time. Every curse word you said, curse words for some of you, you've heard me talk about curse words feel good when you say them. But for about that long. And then it's over with. And then you've got to deal with all the aftermath. You've got to deal with what you did. You've got to deal with, with how you got yourself into that. You've got to deal with that. And so this is 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six things here. There's six days in a week. Six work days in a week. Six thousand years since Adam. So to me, that number matches. It makes sense. The last day is the day of rest. It's the Sabbath. It's the millennial reign. We will finally get our rest. But what is it that we're doing in the time that God has given us in this life? Verse 13 says, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed how? By fire. So we bought a, a safe. It's one of them little lock boxes. It's about this big. We actually put it in our gun safe. But Lisa bought it because she wanted a place to put our important papers. Passports, birth certificates, things like that. Things that, and, it, and we are told that the box is fireproof. Now the cardboard box that it came in, I burnt it already. It's not fireproof. But the box itself. Now, the only way that I'll know for sure if that box is actually fireproof is if what? My house catches on fire and I go to retrieve it. Hopefully, hopefully it's as fireproof as they said it was. Hopefully I'll still have my important papers in that box. And what he's saying is that we do things in this world. Some of them matter. Some of them don't. But every one of them is going to be tried by fire. Every one of them. And only the things that we did for Christ will endure. Everything else is gone. Everything else is gone. Jared, your wife, Christina, is the one person I know of, maybe there's somebody else, that lost everything they had in a house fire. Has anybody else ever been through that? You've been through that. Huh? John had. John has. Anybody else? I hope that never happens. But she was a teenager, and their family lost literally everything that they had 
in a house fire. There was nothing left. But the four of them are still alive. I mean, we can lose things. But people, that's, what, that's a precious to us. Amen? So building, working to build relationships with people that you care about, people that you don't want to lose, that's what's important. But doing things in this world only for ourselves, then we find out we've lost everybody else. We find out those things weren't very important, were they? The fire, he says, the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Roy, you're standing out there, so I'm going to talk about you. How many packs of cigarettes did you smoke back in the day? Two? Three. Just three. Your whole lifetime, only three packs. A day. Okay. So, three packs times five dollars, fifteen dollars a day times, what is that times seven? Huh? One hundred fifteen dollars a week. Four hundred then, four sixty a month in cigarettes. What could you have done with that money now? A lot. Okay, I'm getting to the booze. So we got four hundred. We got four hundred sixty dollars a month just in cigarettes. So how much? How much in booze a day? Fifteen glasses. Fifteen bottles. Fifteen bucks a bottle. But that was nineteen. 70, 1972 money. What is that today? About 40, 50 bucks? So 40, let's say 40 bucks a day times 30 days. So where are we at? 1200 bucks a month plus 450 for the smokes. It's almost two grand a month in booze and cigarettes. What could you have done? What could you do now with that $2,000 a month every month? So I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on Roy. Roy lets me use this example because he recognizes what it cost him. His legs. Okay? He would give all of that money back to get his legs back. Amen? Everything that we do, God's going to light a match to it one of these days. Everything that we do. The sad thing is, we can't go back and redo or undo things we've already done. We can't do it. So what we do is we just wait for God to light a match to it and burn it up. But from that point forward, so you don't drink no more, do you? You don't smoke no more, do you? Okay. And he lives it one day at a time. Today, he's almost made it through today. We hope that by the time he gets home, gets in bed, he's not lighting one up and throwing one down. Tomorrow, he's got to do that all over again. But he decided at some point to build better things. Because wood, hay, and stubble it's no kind of life to live. Amen? It's just not. At some point, when God lights a match to everything and burns it all up, and you're standing there left with nothing, then you wish that you would have done things differently. Okay? So if you got time after that, then that's time that God has given you to try to redeem a little bit of what you've already lost. Am I making sense to you? See, this fiery trial thing, this is going to happen in your lifetime. And God's going to do it at specific times in your life. So you actually come to a place where you realize what really is important and what's not. I'm going to give you an illustration. Then I'm going to, we're going to go into prayer. 
But I, I worked with a guy one time. He was a drywall taper and he was pretty good at it. And, uh, but he had a problem. And his problem was he was having to leave his house at about 4.30 or 5 o'clock every morning. But his problem was he was getting home at 1. And every day... He would get off work, his partner would drive him down south, down toward Farmington, and he would get out of his partner's truck and get in his truck and go to the pool hall. And at the pool hall, he would drink, and he would chase women and play pool. So he'd come to work one day crying, and I said, Woody, what's the matter? And he said, my wife threw me out. And he explained to me what he was doing. And I said, is this the first time? He said, no. And he said, I want her to take me back. I said, she probably won't. I said, but what you can do is quit laying out in the pool hall all hours at night, come home, quit drinking that stupid stuff, quit chasing women at the pool hall, and spend time with your wife and three kids, three little kids he had at home. So he came up with a better solution. He found him a gal at the pool hall. He lost his wife, he lost his three little girls, lost, his, lost everything that he had. And he decided to choose that life. He had it all burnt up, but he decided that it was easier to just keep chasing women at the pool hall than try to start his family over again or try to build a new one. I don't know what's happened to him since then. I've lost track. But some people... Even when they've lost everything, they just keep doing the same things, building out of wood, hay, and stubble, and they're just going to keep losing everything. They're never going to learn. But some people are smart enough to learn. So let, when God burns that stuff up, now you've got a chance to try to redeem and build back some of the stuff that you lost. Only this time, you're not going to build it out of wood, hay, and stubble anymore, are you? 